a huge part of this is a trust factor because you're moving metal to places uh, that you're going to assume other pieces of metal are not going to be there. And if they're there, then you're going to have issues. My father was a pilot in the Air Force, so I mean, I was around aviation from a very young age, and he and he and my mom loved the Air Force, and they always looked like they're having a great time. Great friends, friends I grew up going fishing with, and it was always about flying. and, and He had some great stories, and they they were doing some special missions up on the ice cap and in Greenland, and all these sort of intriguing stories. So I said that uh, looked like it was a, a great occupation if you're going to have that much fun going to work every day. So that's what got me interested in my father. So I applied to all the academies, not knowing which one I would get into. My first choice was the. Air Force Academy, and I was was lucky enough, fortunate enough to be accepted, and entered the class of '75. I figured if I was going to be an aviator, then I wanted to learn about aviation from the ground up, and the experience of the Air Force Academy would prepare me for that. And then they have another program that it was called Third Lieutenant. It was funny because this Third Lieutenant was a program where after your first year, you would they would send you as a uh, cadet you, after your to another military base to be immersed into an active duty organization around the United States, around the world. And we called it, go see the, the real Air Force, because this couldn't be the real Air Force inside the, the walls of the Air Force Academy, as we termed it. And so I was sent to a, uh, the 50th TAC Fighter Wing, Tactical Fighter Wing, was still called Tactical Fighter Wing at the time, at Han Air Base, Germany. And it was the most incredible experience of my life. I was 19 years old and I was flying with the F-4 unit, 510 TAC Fighter Squadron. It was, when I came back from that experience, uh, I knew right then and there that I wanted to be a fighter pilot. And four years later, I was a commissioned second lieutenant. That's the amazing thing about the military, I'm sure you've heard many times, is that as a young age, it gives you such an incredible amount of responsibility and I was uh, assigned as a, uh, what they call FAPE, first assignment IP, and I was at Williams Air Force Base for flight training. And I was brought back to Williams Air Force Base as a T-38 instructor pilot. I had a, a short uh, duty assignment, uh, almost a year at the Pentagon after I left Willie, um, working in uh, legislative liaison. And then uh, I went from there to F-16 uh, Replacement Training Unit, RTU, at MacDill Air Force Base. And out of that, my first assignment was uh, at Nellis Air Force Base. When I was at that, that one-year special duty assignment in the Pentagon, working Legends Liaison, there was a colonel there that I was one of my bosses, his name of uh, uh, Ray White. And he was a former logistics officer on the Thunderbirds. So I'd go into his office and he had all these paraphernalia in his pictures. Now, I'd seen the Thunderbirds, obviously, uh, at graduation from the Air Force Academy. And so that was my first uh, insight into applying for the team. At that time, you, in, you interviewed with the commander of Tactical Air Command, and that was General Creech. And uh, there's a, a rich history of the Thunderbirds and General Creech. And uh, he did a lot for not only Tactical Air Command, but for the Thunderbirds. And I had an interview with General Creech, and when I came out of the interview with General Creech, I was pretty much, I just felt like, you know, I wasn't going to get selected. Not that, uh, you know, he was very professional and everything, but I just, my sense when I walked out was I was going to get selected. I went back down to uh, the squadron. I was a squadron scheduler or assistant scheduler, and I was working, and um, my squadron commander came in there, and, and again, sort of surprised. He says, well, did you get the... Did you get the word? I mean, what are you doing down here? What's going on? And it was, it was a, it sort of surprised me. And he said, no, you were selected for the team. And I was totally taken by surprise, but my squadron commander um, at 4.30 had told me that I'd been selected. I was replacing uh, Howard Atarian, and he was in the left wing men at that time who was leaving was a, uh, Steve Chelander. Um, anyway, those two gentlemen were leaving, and they were going. We were going through training season, and at that time, the, the team they want you to fly three foot wingtip spacing. So between the commander leader's uh, missile rail and your missile rail, rail, if you get in right position, it's three feet. Well, once you're doing the flying, then you know uh, the times I flew with Howard Atarian, uh, he would take the airplane. Says, "Okay, let me show you something." He would demonstrate something, but he would go to 
what they were flying after two years was three feet wing overlap. So instead of three foot wing spacing, they're three feet wing overlap. And I mean, that airplane's right in your face. I'm going, oh, wow. And I remember Jethro, or his call sign was Jethro, Steve Chelander asked me, came up and said, so how's it going? What do you, what do you think? I go, no way. There's no way I'm gonna get three feet wing overlap with the airplanes bouncing around like that. You know, it's just because I was very new in the training season. And I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, he says, I'm gonna call you in three months. And I said, in three months when I call you, I'm gonna ask you after, you know, getting into the show season, he says, uh, so what are you thinking about when you're out there looping and rolling? And I said, Would you, and your answer is gonna be something along the lines, gee, I wonder what I'm gonna have for dinner tonight. And I go, Jethro, never in a million years. And about four months later, he called me and he says, so, three, what are you thinking about when you're looping and rolling? You know, if everything's going normal, you know, he says, yeah, well, I'm gonna have dinner for dinner tonight. So it's just a matter of training and acclimating, but uh, it's a sort of a testament to the training that uh, the team puts together and how they build the team to get you to that point where you can get to a, where you find three feet wing overlap. Davis Mountain Air Force Base was, a, was my first air show in Tucson, Arizona. You know, you get the butterflies, like you go out to fly for, you know, you start of a, uh, an athletic event. Anything that would be a, something would generate some excitement, those feelings you get in your stomach. Um, they were all there and, and you, you were just out there to make sure that you didn't, you weren't, you didn't screw up because you're, you're very, you're scrutinized and you're graded on every air show and you, after every air show, they go through the film and the logistics officer, uh, number seven, he, at that time was number seven, he, he would sit there and he'd grade every maneuver, you know, three, you were, you were cupped, you were towed, three, you were this, you were that, you were this, you are that, or if you did something, you know, the boss would say, okay, what was your, what were you thinking? What happened? Why'd that happen? And so every maneuver was, to every individual was, you know, pulled apart, you know, what, what happened there? What went wrong? So, you know, once you walked in the door, you, you had to leave your feelings, your ego, or whatever you were, were outside the door, because once you got inside the door and get a debrief, there was no holds barred. So first year, 85, we flew at Andrews Air Force Base. And that's where I went, that's where I grew up. So it was, it was a, you know, proud moment because my wife is from that area as well. Um, and so all my high school friends, my mom and dad, I mean, it was a bit, and they made it, and the team makes a big deal out of it. If you go to your hometown, the team makes a big deal out of it. So that was a show that stood, stood out for me. The other thing that, one of the, bit, the, the incredible things about the team was that you would get to meet, and I'm not talking about famous people. I mean, we got to meet famous people. But the things were the, the families or the young kids and their parents who would, you would meet in an air show. But the one that really stuck out to me was in Boston. We went to, um, we were flying in the air show in Boston and we went to the Shriner Hospital there. I went with uh, Haas Jones and I was the new guy on the block. So Haas was sort of, Haas had been on the team and uh, so he was sort of leading and he and I went with him and it was because we went to the children to the burn unit now remember uh, Haas sort of preparing uh, preparing me to go in there Sorry. But, so we went into this, uh, and these kids, and who were, who had been burned. And the thing is, you didn't want to show, you know, the emotion or the, you know, but these kids, you would never, you would never know that they knew that they were, you know, had gone through this horrific experience. So we, you know, <laughs> Haas was was uh, quite the PR individual anyway. So we went through this, and I, I just remember walking. 
well, walking out of there just thinking, wow, these people, how resilient these young kids were. And their, and their moms and dads and their families and their moms and dads were in there. And, and how much fun, how much they enjoyed us coming in there. We were wearing our uniforms, we were giving them stuff, you know, that we could typically give to them. But. Like a, as you can tell, that that was that was probably pretty emotional. There's a very close camaraderie between the uh, Thunderbirds and the Blue Angels, and every year now I don't I, I'm not sure they still do it. I think they do, but every year we would host each other either at Pensacola or, or at Nellis. It was it's not a published air show. It was just. We'd fly to Pensacola, they'd host us. We'd pull up, fly on our net, we'd do, put on a show, they'd put on a show, which was basically just for the base. And they would, the next year, be at Nell's, do the same thing. The other thing was, the biggest uh, insult, as we call it, that you could do was put your smoke on their jets. That was like a real put down. So I was the ops officer, so I had the schedule, and I would fly, and I'd have, you know, next week's schedule, and I'd make changes, because if there's anything wrong on it, it I'm sure it, it all had to be just exactly right. But I had on that schedule, I said, I want to know where the Blue Angels are 24-7, seven days a week, 365 days a year. I do not want to be surprised by the Blue Angels. So <laughs> we were in Biloxi, Mississippi. We're getting to do, we flew in early, we're going to do an air show. And the day before, we're going to do a practice. And, but I already knew that on the schedule that the Blues were at home uh, from some downtime at Pensacola. And Biloxi and Pensacola are 15 minute flight apart. And so I had called into the Blue Angels uh, portraying to be a Naval Academy cadet who was on leave. And I heard the Blue Angels were, were home. And I wanted to come out and see him and meet him or whatever I could do. Could you tell me what their schedule is on a particular day? And so they willingly shared that, hey, we'd love to have you come out and see the Blues. I said, okay, thank you. So I knew when they were going to be marching down to their airplanes to go out for a practice. So I adjusted our practice earlier. So I went to Boss Riggs at Boss Riggs. I put another thousand pounds airplane on the on the jets. We're going to go smoke the blues. <laughs> so we took off six ship formation, diamond, going up the coast, out over the water, 500 feet. Boss Riggs comes up, comes up on uh, Pensacola Tower. It's at Pensacola Tower, Thunderbird. Uh, this is Thunderbird one. He goes. You can hear the hesitation in their voice. He goes, say again? I said, Pensacola Tower, this is Thunderbird 1. He says, uh, go ahead, Thunderbird 1. He says, want the airfield for 15 minutes. He says, you got it. So he said, cleared off three, because I could never go a different frequency unless the ball cleared me off. Rolled over to Pensacola to Blue Angel Ops. I go, Blue Angel Ops, this is Thunderbird 3. And I go, again, the same sort of head. Say again? He says, yeah, Blue Angel Ops, Thunderbird 3. He says, yeah, Thunderbird 3, what can I, what can I do for it? I said, you might want to step outside and watch this. It rolled off the frequency. And the next thing I knew, we were rolling in left. So I could see the field, but we were coming in, we we're coming in low. And um, I could see through the formation because before the boss rolled out, I could see the jets and I could see the pilots. And we went right over the top of them. Smoke on, came back, he did a big another whiffer dip, big turnaround, came back 180 degrees, went back over and smoke on, then we went poof, back out of the water and left. But Grizz Watson was the ops officer, he called me, I had a few choice words for me, we were laughing. And it's those experiences that, that you know, you, that interaction you have with the, 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 the people, that's to me what's, what's was a lot of fun. As soon as I took that uniform off, or I wasn't standing in front of that red, white, blue airplane, I was just another person in the crowd. So what really attracts them to it is the, uh, just, I think, the pride. I think there's, uh, you know, red, white, and blue, the American flag. It sounds a, little, a lot like apple pie, but I think there's a lot of truth to that. Because again, like I said, as soon as I took off that uniform, I wouldn't stand in front of that airplane. It wasn't me. They, they just saw that. That was the United States. So. That's what it meant to me.